Well, good morning and welcome everybody to this uh, webinar. It's a pleasure to have um, Dr. Jamie Donatuto and Eric Grossman present today. Uh, this webinar is being hosted by the North Pacific LCC. This project was funded both by the MPLCC jointly with the Northwest Climate Science Center and EPA. You'll hear more details about that shortly. I'm going to provide a quick introduction and um, uh, talk about this webinar a little bit, and then we'll turn over the controls to the presentation. Um, the North Pacific LCC is one of 22 LCCs established by the Department of Interior a couple of years ago. We're a self-directed partnership between federal agencies, states, tribes, NGOs, and others, and we're defined and convened to collaboratively uh, assess science needs and jointly address broad-scale conservation issues such as climate change in the region. When we convened a couple of years ago, we knew it was important to engage our tribal partners uh, and understand traditional knowledge and understand some of the tribal uh, cultures and priorities important to them as they are key natural resource managers and co-managers in the region. And we funded seven pilot projects. And what you're hearing today is, a, is already results of one of the uh, pilot projects that we funded. Um, Dr. Jamie Donatuto is um, helping present. She's the environmental health analyst with the Swinomish Tribal Community. She and her colleague Larry Camp will focus work on developing culturally meaningful and appropriate community-based indicators of indigenous health in the Coast Salish Sea with tribes and First Nations. Also presenting is Dr. Eric Grossman. He's been working on climate change and ecosystem science in the Skagit since 2006. He researches estuary mixing, sediment transport, nearshore habitat change, and other topics. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started now. We're going to pass the controls to you, Eric. I'd just like to let everybody know we are going to um, place everybody on mute to m avoid any background information. And the presenters, both you, Eric, and Jamie, should push star six to unmute yourselves. And then uh, during the course of the webinar, when we're opening up for questions, we'll mass unmute everybody. If you have any questions, Comments, feel free to use the chat box on the WebEx. We'll be monitoring that. So without any further delay, we're going to pass the controls over to Eric Grossman. And Eric, be sure and press star six to unmute your phone. And uh, feel free to begin. Mute on. Eric, are you able to hear me? Jamie, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I'm I'm waiting for Eric. Yeah, I am too. Be sure and push star six, Eric, if you can hear us, because we don't hear you right now. Can you unmute Eric? Eric, we still don't hear you. Well, while he's getting ready, I can give a quick introduction since our title slide is already up. Uh, my name is Jamie Donatuto. I'm the Environmental Health Analyst uh, for the Swinomish Indian Tribal Community, and I want to thank all of you for participating today. I'm uh, really excited that people are interested in listening to this project, and I just want to say if you are patient and are able to make it through our entire presentation, we would love to have an open discussion with those of you who are still available and have the time to hear about what you're doing in your communities and what your priorities are. So we're really hoping to have an interactive discussion at the end of the presentation. Just a bit of a heads up on that. Eric, are you on the line yet? Eric just sent us a quick note that star six isn't working on his phone. So we're going to unmute everybody and hope that we can reconnect Eric to the line and we just ask that you all um, make sure that your manual mutes on your phone are turned on so we don't hit pick up background information. Okay, unmute everybody. Mute off. You Can you hear me now? Yeah, Eric, we got you now. Go ahead. Great. I think Jamie's going to lead us. Sure. So this particular project, as John mentioned, was uh, a pilot project that we started in partnership with USGS who Eric is representing, and the Slave Tooth First Nation, which is a First Nation in British Columbia. And what we wanted to do was think about specific climate change impacts, uh, sea level rise and storm surge, and how those would impact near shore areas in two different 
Coast Salish indigenous communities uh, where shellfish and particularly clam digging is a very important part of the community. Eric, could you go to the next slide? So what you see here, for those of you who are not familiar with the Coast Salish region, is the Salish Sea is actually a sea that, that spans the U.S.-Canada international border. And so the Coast Salish community is made up of tribes in Washington State and First Nations in D.C. It gives you a better idea of where we're at. Next slide, please, Eric. Specifically, Swimish is a federally recognized tribe in Washington State. Uh, part of the 1855 Treaty of Point Elliott. The reservation is approximately 7,000 acres of upland area and 3,000 acres of tideland. So the reservation is 90% surrounded by water. Traditionally, it's fishing people, also harvesting um, and upland resources were quite important. But there's a very common theme that you'll hear throughout Coast Salish, which is when the tide is out, the table is set. Next slide, please, Eric. So the reason why we wanted to start this particular project was because all of us in our various backgrounds who work with tribes and First Nations and Native communities know that oftentimes health is very narrowly defined as an individual physiological health impact of morbid morbidity or mortality. But in many tribal communities, tribal priorities are not only physical, but social, mental, spiritual, cultural. And it's important to think of them not only on an individual scale, but also on a familial and community scale. And this comes into play in many different areas, but specifically for climate change and thinking about climate change impacts. How do you assess that? How do you evaluate these relationships, what their priorities might be within the community, and what sort of impacts they may receive as climate change occurs? Next slide, please, Eric. So here's an overall framework for this particular project. Um, I'll talk a bit more about the Swinomish Climate Change Action Initiative. Um, but in 2009, we did an impact assessment. And in 2010, we came out with an action plan. But there were a few gaps in that action plan. And one of them was looking at specifically community health. Because at the time, we hadn't figured out how we wanted to evaluate or think about community health. And so my partner, Larry Candlin, and I worked for several years developing the indigenous health indicators, which I'll get into a bit of the methods in a minute. And then with this particular project, what we did was we pilot tested the indigenous health indicators um, with Swinomish community members and with Slay Tooth community members using um, the results of a near shore vulnerability assessment that Eric led and also Sarah Grossman from Swinomish. And after we gave those results, we did a pilot test of an impact evaluation, and we'll give those results to you today. And ideally, this particular circle that you see is something that we would like to reiterate in a representative fashion, because this particular project is a pilot project, and we are going to do a larger scale project of this that will be representative of the Swinomish community, and then bring that information into our impact assessment and action plan. And Eric and I will talk a bit about that project at the end. Next slide, please, Eric. So just a bit of an overview about the work that Swinomish initiated in terms of looking at climate change. As I said, in 2009, we did the technical report that came out. Uh, it had an impact assessment and a vulnerability assessment and a risk analysis in it. These primarily focused on infrastructure, uh, roads and buildings. There was a bit of biological assessment as well. It was not incredibly detailed. Uh, there was a physiological health section. It was, it was short. Uh, but there, as I mentioned, there was no community health section in this particular plan. There is a placeholder in the action plan that came out in 2012. And that reviews strategies and criteria, uh, assessed assess requirements, and develop and prioritize recommendations. And the Swinomish Senate has adopted this, and we are moving forward in this plan. And one of the pieces was to fill in those particular data gaps so that we could have a better picture of how to move forward. And at the bottom is a link to those reports if you're interested. Next slide, please, Eric. And I'm throwing this matrix up here because it just gives you an idea of what was in the impact assessment in terms of how different sectors or elements were assessed. And so what we use is a simple scale from low to high. And they're also color-coded. 
and there's also a probability in terms of uh, spatial scale for years um, and temporal scale. But what you can see with this is that it's pretty easy to read in terms of how things are assessed, but it also makes it quite easy to bring in other aspects, for instance, things like community health, and able to assess them in a way that may initially they may seem like incommensurate scales, but actually you can make them work together. And we'll talk about that in a minute as well. Next slide, please, Eric. So a bit of background on the indigenous health indicators. You see a picture of my colleague Larry Campbell. Uh, Larry and I have worked together for almost 15 years, and part of the work we've been doing is the development of the indigenous health indicators. Uh, it started out by interviewing over 100 Swimish community members about what health meant to them, what prioritizations were. Uh, we found recurring themes not found in traditional health assessments. So, again, thinking about familial and community scales, the social, the cultural, and the spiritual health. And also this very strong connection between people and the environment. And not just a one-way arrow. It's a reciprocal relationship that is often not reflected in even things like ecosystem services. So then we broadened our work and worked with other Coast Salish communities to refine the themes that we had heard and develop indicators. And this particular project is pilot testing these indicators both at Swinomish and Tsleil-Waututh. Next slide, please, Eric. So these are the six overall themes that we heard repeatedly. Natural resources security, cultural use and practices, education, community connections, self-determination and sovereignty, and this last one we're calling calm mind or emotional security. This one is very clear to us in terms of its meaning, but we're having a difficult time finding a name for it. So this, all of these are still in an iterative process, but that name particularly may change. At the bottom, you see a website where there's more information on these six indicators. And as I said, this is an iterative process, and they are continually developing. We are working with tribes across the country now to test these. To give you an idea of what's beneath each of these main themes, in natural resources security, you have not only abundance and access to natural resources, you also have the health of the natural resources themselves. Are they already impaired? How vulnerable are they to new impacts, for instance, climate change-related impacts, if they are already, for example, contaminated from perhaps a super fun site. Something like community connections. That's really how well, how cohesive is a community? Is the traditional sharing practices going on? If someone isn't a fisher, perhaps they're an elder or they have another important role in the community, are they still able to access the traditional foods that are important to them? And then, for instance, education isn't just about intergenerational knowledge transfer. It's also about the elders themselves. Are they healthy, respected? Uh, the youth, are they actively interested in the uptake, and then the knowledge itself, the teaching. Next slide, please, Eric. So how do you measure something like this? These seem very intangible, and oftentimes putting a num number to them seems repugnant to many people, which is completely understandable. So we looked at different types of metrics. Natural measures is one type of metric, and that would be, for instance, counting numbers, number of diabetics in a community. Uh, those, that didn't seem to work in terms of metrics for us. Then we looked at proxy measures. And you can use a proxy measure to determine what is going on as a representative number. So for instance, number of community participation in ceremonies could potentially be a proxy for cultural importance. So what we ultimately went with was something that we that's called constructed metrics. And that's when other scales aren't possible. And so you use simple scales like like art scales um, or low to high ratings, good to bad ratings. And these are well known across the country. APGAR scales that you use to assess the health of a newborn baby is a constructed metric. The Dow Jones is a constructed metric. So they're metrics that we're all quite familiar with, um, and they're very easy to use in thinking about assessing something that you don't want to put a number to. Next slide, please, Eric. So what we did to develop these indigenous health indicators is while Eric and Sarah were working on the vulnerability assessment, we really wanted to get an idea of a baseline, essentially, of where people thought that they were at now in the community in terms of access to these near shore areas that are really important for shellfish harvesting. So in the, in the course of a workshop, what we did was talk about the indigenous health indicators and then ask people to assess where they were now. And we use wireless polling clickers and so that even when you're in a large group, you can vote anonymously. 
And we also, the other nice thing about the clickers is they put the results immediately up on the PowerPoint screen. And so you don't have the individual results, but you have the collated results of how people voted. And that really spurs discussion and additional thought about what's going on. Next slide, please, Eric. So, for example, here's, a, here's one question that we might ask uh, in terms of community connection. Where is the community at now? And so you could use a simple like art scale of 1 to 5. This isn't the scale that we use, but it does give you an example. How does everyone in the community, does everyone in the community have access to natural resources such as local clams and fish if they want them? And then they can simply vote with their wireless polling clickers and the answers come up immediately. Next slide, please, Eric. So this particular picture is a picture of the western side of the reservation. It's called the Lone Tree Point, and it's an incredibly culturally important area for the Swinomish tribe. Traditionally, this is where many people came in the summer and lived all summer long. Clan dug, beach sand. Um, this area is very rich in natural resources. Now, um, this area is primarily used by uh, an RV resort called Thousand Trails, but tribal members still have access to this area, and it is the prime clam digging area to this day on the reservation. And this is where we focused our studies. I'm going to hand it over to Eric now because this, he's really going to talk about um, the modeling of the fiscal process. Well, good morning, everybody. So what we did to um, begin this assessment of uh, future change to the coastal zone and, and habitat and cultural resources is develop a project framework uh, where we could include physical and potentially something like Bayesian modeling to examine how <clears throat> drivers of change will manifest themselves from climate change, ocean acidification, and uh, relative sea level rise and storms that you see up here in blue, um, and influence those indigenous health indicators. Today what we're going to just talk about is this, the drivers from sea level rise and waves and as they're influenced by shoreline armoring. <clears throat> and the motivation for this is there's a, a conceptual models and some new re research that shows with rising sea levels, we're going to be influenced by a significantly larger wave energy and storm surges such that, uh, like Tribaldi showed, 100-year uh, storm surge events become much more frequent with rising water levels. And then even inside the Salish Sea, there's some evidence that peak winds that drive uh, some of the local generated waves may be increasing or changing and is a really complex system of wave energy uh, influencing coastal topography. So our approach was twofold, uh, a basic vulnerability modeling assessment uh, as part of a phase one study, which is this study, and that would then inform what kinds of process modeling we want to do uh, in phase two. And so for this vulnerability assessment, we decided to um, synthesize and map existing information, uh, sea level rise and wave scenarios, and then various habitat traits and changes along the shore. For the sea level rise and wave scenarios, we generally uh, considered uh, various IPCC predictions and the National Academy of Sciences 2012 uh, assessment of sea level rise scenarios along the west coast. <clears throat> and we came up with some local scenarios for this area uh, for different times out into the future uh, and essentially adopted the majority of the recommendations from the National Academy of Sciences report except for vertical land motion, which we have um, produced some, some individual scenarios for this area largely following Moat's 2008 report. Um, and you can see these numbers here. I'm not going to go into detail. Uh, but the example that we're going to show today is just one of the high-end members out at 2100 of about 1.29 meters of sea level rise, uh, which you can see falls here uh, within the sort of middle of the mean and max predictions from the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, we think this is pretty justified because as you look around the world at trends in sea level rise, we are noticing uh, that we're following the highest IPCC predict predictions back in the past. Uh, satellite altimetry is showing this accelerating, and so anything modeling the high end is, is 
fairly representative and um, appropriate for a risk assessment like this. There's also some natural and regional interesting uh, issues here along the West Coast observed in Seattle, San Francisco, and San Diego of uh, changes on the decadal scale of sea level rise with rates much higher uh, in the middle of this last century, uh, followed by the last 20 or so years of fairly lower rates of sea level rise. And so the question is, this uh, natural decadal changes may occur again in the future, and so we may see changes to these predictions. Now for the habitat traits, what we've been doing is combining uh, information on elevation and morphology with new digital elevation models, substrates, including grain size, particle size, uh, submerged vegetation cover, clam distributions, the harvest areas that tribal members uh, prefer, and then shoreline armoring and its effects on shoreline migration. So what we've been doing for the elevation data is uh, merging new airborne LIDAR data with offshore sonar data. Often this is filling in major gaps that we've had in this portion of our coastal zone where either data did not exist at all or it was fairly, fairly old, like 1800s, 1950s. Um, this provides us with these beautiful digital elevation models with which to then assess changes in morphology with much more rigor. Uh, these data have errors on them of the order of 15 centimeters or so. Uh, prior to that, we were talking about errors of a half a meter or more. And this just shows the colored area, the mean low, low water edge and contours of one meter. Up in the north, you can see it's fairly narrow. Out here where it's kind of the prime uh, clam digging area, you can see it's much wider. Uh, we just overlay a number of different substrates. You can also see in this central region uh, mixed fine sediment, whereas to the north and south, uh, much more coarser uh, materials, sometimes gravel beds. And then this is really the crux of it. This is the shellfish uh, growing area, um, constrained on the lower end by uh, mean low, low water, and essentially the limit for preferred clam access. <clears throat> Most tribal members are happy to come out here at low tide in summer and, and dig away and not necessarily go diving offshore. But you can see this is the distribution today, uh, fairly broad area. And when we model that uh, 129 centimeters of sea level rise, it, it, it migrates upward and it reduces in area. In fact, it's about a 27% decrease in that suitable shellfish growth and harvest area. Interestingly enough, uh, you can see here seawalls lining the shore uh, comprise about 30% of this shoreline area. And offshore of these seawalls, uh, both present and future clam harvest areas are much narrower. <coughs> this is really uh, just exemplifying the interesting and complex nature of our different coastlines. We have a, an interesting stepped topography of this coast whereas a uniform, steep, or, or low-lying uh, coast would be fairly easy to predict as sea level would slowly rise up. But here we've got this, uh, at the Lone Tree area, a stepped region of this low tide terrace intercepting, intersecting a, a steeper beach face. And so you can realize that a small rise in sea level is quickly going to flood and inundate this broad shallow area and start rising up along a, shore, a steeper shore face. And then the armoring really starts to play into this. If the armoring goes in and fixes the shoreline, the uh, sediment from above the, the armoring can't necessarily be eroded and redistributed to change the beach face profile uh, or let the beach migrate. This is critical to clams. And we think this is a big issue in a number of places on an unarmored beach, even just a small amount of sea level rise would allow the beach to migrate landward, uh, mix those sediments, and allow shellfish to migrate with those changes in substrate. Whereas on an armored beach, uh, you can see the seawall here really fixes the position, reduces sediment delivery from uh, the landward side. And what happens is uh, the beach 
the wave energy uh, is able to scour out material, leaving just the coarse material. In fact, the wave energy, as it reflects off these walls, has been shown to increase, uh, creating additional scour and turbidity, all of which are not very conducive for uh, these favored clams. And we think we see this already in this study area. To the north here is an example of uh, a cross-shore profile in front of a, one of the longer lived seawalls, whereas down here in the central part is one of the uh, preferred clamming areas without a seawall. And you can see the much broader nature of that uh, more natural uh, shore face with about two times the area for clamming today and a broader, um, less uh, steep slope. In fact, the substrate up there as well is much coarser in front of the seawall uh, compared to in front of uh, that natural beach. So obviously that's um, uh, pro providing some insight that maybe the next step for us to move is a much more robust uh, modeling assessment of the physical forces of waves intersecting these sea level rise scenarios and habitats. And so that's our next step. Uh, an EPA STAR grant is going to allow us to develop a stronger process-based model to bring in waves, storm surge, and look at their, their influence, both run-up, inundation, scour, on various habitats and cultural resources. And what we want to do is, is build it into uh, a tool we already have uh, assembled with the Nature Conservancy for Puget Sound Coastal Resilience. Currently, it allows us to examine the intersection of a number of future sea level rise scenarios over ecosystems, shoreline characteristics, land use, and infrastructure. And what we've done as part of that is run wave modeling using the INVEST tool and the Coastal Protection Module. And this is just an example of this central um, profile here, just south of the, of the Swinomish Reservation. And the tool allows managers and users to come in and examine a number of different wave and wind scenarios, sea level uh, position, and storm surge scenarios, as well as um, manipulate different habitat uh, structures, uh, the extent of that, uh, sea grasses and marshes, the cover, and then, for example, slide these slider bars back and forth to simulate different management actions uh, likely to expand habitat or such and then examine, by running the scenario, the influence of waves along those shoreline profiles and the influence up towards uh, infrastructure at the shore. And this is just an example of that particular coastal profile uh, before the, the user manipulated any of those habitat traits. Uh, the, the wave energy coming in from a two-meter wave uh, essentially decreased as you moved up onto this shallow platform and with the management action of expanding tidal marsh offshore, you can see that the waves were uh, dampened uh, considerably farther offshore. This is a nice tool that now we want to bring towards the Swinomish Reservation to examine not just vulnerability to, to waves and sea level rise, but also potential management strategies. And I'll come back to this right at the end of the webinar. So I think now we go back to Jamie. Thanks, Eric. So I'm going to get back into how we took the vulnerability assessment that Eric worked on and brought that back to the community and then thought about how to assess indigenous health based on that vulnerability assessment. And so as I, sh I showed you before, at the beginning of the workshop that we ran, we asked people to tell us where they felt they were now in terms of the different health indicators. And we did a series of ranking exercises with them. And then Eric presented some of the data that he's showing to you today um, in a bit of a different format, but basically talking about what would happen at Lone Tree Point or what, what the models would, are projecting would happen at Lone Tree Point by 2100. And then ask people again to think about how their different aspects of indigenous health would be impacted based on what Eric had shown. And so this is an example from thinking about natural resources security. Um, and this one is, again, just an example, but this time looking using just a one to four scale, saying, are there enough locations available to harvest? We asked this question first in the beginning, and then I collated the slide to show you again an answer 
based on 2100, and this is real-time data from the workshop. So as, as you would guess, people would say, for the most part, that things would get worse based on the information that Eric gave them. And we went through all of the different health indicators in this way. Eric, could you go to the next slide, please? So what we found may be a bit surprising to some of you. Not all of the indicators were projected to be equally impacted or to get worse. And the priorities also uh, were very interesting to find out with the different communities. What I'm going to show you is just the swim image data, uh, but we do have a paper that, I, that is an open access paper. Anyone can read it that has the slow truth data in it as well if you're interested in seeing that and comparing them because the results are different. It's very obvious that different communities prioritize and think about aspects of community health in different ways. So what you see here is the sensitivity matrix. And going across the top, it says projected impacts. So people were saying whether or not they thought that there would be a bit of an impact, medium-sized impact, medium-high, or high impact, based on what Eric had shown in the projections. But what is interesting is you see that there's also a column all the way on the left called potential opportunity. And folks actually thought that education would get better in the future. And there was a lot of discussion around this in the focus group. And what people were saying was, look, even having something like this, workshops within the community, and talking about what's going on out there is education. And we can, once we know, then we can really start talking about it and thinking about ways to do something about it. And so they actually see this as a potential opportunity to improve education within the community. What was most impacted all the way at the right side was cultural use. Um, so that was said that it would be most highly impacted because Lone Tree Point is, a, as I said, an incredibly important cultural area and also the most important shellfish harvesting area on the reservation as well as for beach staining. But if you look at the rows, it's on the highest row or the lowest priority concern. And so what we did was we, weighed, we ranked them in projected impacts, but also priority concerns as a ranking. And it might be a head scratcher to think, why would cultural use be the lowest priority concern, one of the lowest, including community connection? And those are actually quite connected in many ways. And what a lot of folks were saying, particularly the elders, is that we will always have our culture with us. Culture is not stagnant. You know, we've been here for hundreds and thousands of years before anybody else, and we'll be here afterwards as well. We'll always be here. But what we really need to focus on the most are our natural resources. And so you'll see natural resources security is the highest priority concern. So essentially what that group was saying was focus on our natural resources. We want to know where the clams are going to be. We want to know, do we take the armoring out and let them go off the beach? Are there other beaches that we could use in the future? We want to ensure that those natural resources will be there for future use. Next slide, please, Eric. So as Eric mentioned, uh, we're now working on a new project based on the results of our pilot test. And this is an EPA-funded project, and the title is Coastal Climate Impacts to First Foods, Cultural Sites, and Tribal Health and Well-Being. And so now that was one pilot project with one workshop in each community, which would not be representative of the community's full belief. So we're going to be running several workshops, and as Eric said, they're really working on detailing that model. And so here are the two hypotheses, which is the combination of sea level rise, wave impacts, and shoreline development will change the coastal ecosystems that support Swinomish First Foods and those place-based relationships, which would in turn impact community health and well-being. And the second part is community sustainability will benefit from a spatial and temporal ecological assessment of vulnerability that is integrated with indigenous health indicators to strengthen adaptive capacity and inform strategic coastal planning. So really thinking about those habitats and nearshore species, such as forage, fish, and clams, how they may be impacted in the future, what sorts of impacts they'll have on community health, and then really thinking about the ranking and weighting of those health indicators, bringing them in to the current assessment we already have, which is a low to high color-coded scale I showed you earlier. So you actually can, even though they may seem incommensurate, they're not. You can include them in that scale and then go forward with planning. Eric, did you want to add anything about the, the new EPA project? That sounds great. Okay, next slide, please. So to address that strategic planning that Jamie just mentioned, we wanted to show you just this one example of um, a mutual benefits analysis that we're doing 
uh, just to the south of Skagit Bay in Port Susan Bay. In fact, if you look out in the distance here, you can see the Swinomish Reservation that we've been talking about. Um, this is really one of the most interesting sites I've, I've come across inside the Salish Sea. Um, there was anecdotal evidence from the coastal landowners here, uh, farm communities, that the first observed storm surge overwash of their, of their coastal levees occurred just as recent as 2006. And they presume that it may be related to the loss of tidal marsh out here in front of the seawalls. So we investigated this, and um, through reconstructions of air photos, we've been able to document that, in fact, the marsh extended about a kilometer further offshore in this northern portion of the bay, and notice that the river uh, orientation here was sort of straight out to this area, likely providing fresh water and sediment that would feed those marshes. Since then, uh, the, the marsh has retreated, like I said, about a kilometer in the north and a lot less down here near the river mouth. Um, but these rates are incredibly high, and they've stranded this old tidal marsh out on the tide flat. Um, in 2012, the Nature Conservancy uh, put in a, a restoration effort here to realign, well, take out levees that would restrict the flow of water and try to realign the river back out into the middle of the bay and restore that sediment delivery back to those marshes. And so what we've been doing is accessing the benefits of restoring these tidal marshes, not just for their ecosystem function and salmon recovery, providing juvenile Chinook uh, rearing habitat, but also coastal protection. And so if we look at a transect here on that um, area that's uh, eroded so heavily, this is that profile here with a reconstructed uh, marsh extending about a kilometer offshore of the dike footprint and about a meter taller based on our, our understanding of that remnant elevation. And this bottom plot shows what happens uh, when we have a marsh restored to its 1960s extent for all deep water wave heights coming into the area uh, with a fairly short wave period of about four seconds. But for a tide of three meters, which is sort of a high tide today, versus a tide of four meters, which would be a very high tide today along with storm surge, or an analog for future sea level. And you can see in each case that the, the extent of uh, reconstructed marsh here to that 1960s position reduces the overall water level, uh, wave height, storm surge, and tide level by about a half a meter. So it's pretty impressive. It's got the potential to have this mutual benefit. And I bring this up because along that Swinomish Reservation, there's opportunities for similar restoration opportunities, including oyster reefs that probably have a lot more buffering effect on waves. And this is really what we're trying to get to, is a vulnerability as well as a resilience assessment where there's opportunities to help protect uh, cultural resources and concerns and then restore functionality. And I think Jamie's up. So just to start wrapping it up, this new project, these are some of our expected results. I won't go through them all, um, but it gives you an idea of what we're hoping to get out of this three-year project, which will end in 2017. And the picture on the right, I mentioned that the low tree point is important not only for clam digging, but also beach sailing. Uh, this is a beach sailing picture from uh, low tree point with our chairman and the president of the National Indian the National Congress of American Indians in the center, throwing fish, uh, Brian Cladisby. Next slide, please. So Eric and I wanted to give you our contact information. Uh, again, we want to thank you so much for listening to this presentation and to say that we do hope to have a discussion with those of you who are still on the phone about what your interests and priorities are. Uh, again, this research was supported by the Swinomish Tribe, uh, two EPA star grants, uh, the NPLCC, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and Northwest Climate Center. And the picture on the right is a picture of an offering. Um, this is from the first salmon ceremony, or what we call it, Swinomish, the blessing of the fleet. And it's just a really, it's a visual demonstration of how local natural resources are important, not just for feeding the body, but also for feeding the spirit. Could you go to the next slide, please, Eric? 
So this is what we'd really love to hear from you. Um, what are some climate change and health-related projects that you're working on? What additional information would be most helpful for you in your work? What studies do you want to see done? What studies are you doing? Uh, and at the bottom, as I mentioned, we have a, the open access journal article to the information that we presented in this particular project if you'd like to learn more. And so I'm hoping that uh, we can address some questions if there are any and perhaps have a discussion with those of you who are left on the phone. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Eric. Uh, this is John. Great job. You covered a lot of ground from human health, environmental indicators to sea level rise impacts on resource security. And then you put these three questions up to spark the conversation. Everybody is unmuted now, so if you have any questions or comments, just feel free to jump in. If it becomes unmanageable, then we'll ask that people raise their hands and we can moderate the questions. But for now, let's just uh, open the floor to questions. Uh, we'll also monitor the chat box, and if any questions come in the chat box, we'll convey them to you, Eric and Jamie. Would anybody like to share some of the work that they're working on? Yeah, this is Steve Klein with EPA in Corvallis. Hello. Hi, Hi, yeah, we're working on a project with the Nooksack Indian Tribe on the South Fork uh, Nooksack River that involves salmon restoration under climate change. And, you know, we have, you know, done the vulnerability assessment, done the climate change modeling, looking at habitat, and trying to essentially understand uh, how to reduce vulnerability uh, in the context of restoration. Um, but where we've not made the connection is with this um, the uh, community construct of the Nooksack Indian people themselves. And so um, I guess my comment is is that that connection is maybe often harder than uh, and from place to place depending on um, you know the the access and the, and the uh, and the uh, to the tribe itself. Thank you for that comment. I would completely agree with you. I mean, I think that being a tribal employee for the last 15 years and working very closely with a, a well-known community member and tribal elder has definitely provided a different type of access, uh, but also interest in the community. And there is there is certainly um, an issue of being known versus not being known and a uh, willingness of people to answer questions. And I've, I've worked with other groups who are also interested in this type of work and have asked me, well, how can we do this? And the first thing I always say is find a local representative and pay them well. <laughs> and that is the first, that is really the best way uh, to be able to work with community members if you're not from the community, is really to work with a, a community representative and who is interested in the project and is willing to train up on how to run workshops or to think about indigenous health, do interviews, so it's a mixed methods approach, uh, and ensure that you pay them adequately for their time. Thank you. Can you hear me there? Yeah. Oh, hi, this is Stephanie Moore from Northwest Fishery Science Center, uh, NOAA in Seattle. Um, thanks, Jamie and Eric. I've I've been following your work and I'm and I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, Eric probably knows um, a little bit about what I've been working on in Puget Sound, and I've been primarily looking at uh, the potential impacts of climate change on harmful algal blooms um, that can contaminate shellfish, and then potentially also um, you know reduce access to shellfish as a resource. Um, in some coastal tribal communities. Um, I've just started working with uh, two tribes on the outer Washington coast, um, again, focusing on harmful algal blooms, but uh, I think that we've, it's, an, it's an added pressure when you combine um, what we project with, with climate change and increasing toxic blooms as well as with ocean acidification, um, you know, we now sort of have a, a number of interacting effects that um, could be influencing shellfish resources. And so I'm, um, I guess that's a little bit for the, the, the first question there, what climate change and health-related projects am I working on? And 
Um, so in terms of what studies would I, you know, sort of what I'd like to see done, I'd, you know, I'd love to explore some um, potential for collaborating and, and seeing if we can start looking at some of these interactive effects. Um, I think that's it's, it's a big unknown right now, but I think we're kind of getting close enough where we can really start um, to combine some of the, the information that we have on these individuals um, climate stresses and uh, and get a more comprehensive impact assessment. That sounds great. Thank you, Anthony. <laughs> yeah, that's great. We'll follow up. Great. Thank you. If no one else has um, a question right now, I wanted to just um, add one more uh, comment about one of the reasons why we're doing this work is, um, as you all know, Western science tends to look for indicators to to monitor and detect change. Um, and I think a lot of us coming from a science background wonder if these indicators are working well enough for us and for different um, communities. And then when you have a shared like the Salish Sea that spans this political border, you know, are there policies in place to find solutions and fix the problems? And they're not always so uh, standardized and um, integrated. And so one of the reasons we're doing this is to evaluate whether these indigenous health indicators might be more representative of um, different community needs and then help to inform regulators like the EPA, uh, British, the Environment for um, the Ministry for Environment in British Columbia, and other groups to, to sort of a, address some of these indicators in a, in a little more holistic way. And so I think that gets also back to Bethany's point is that there are these just very complex interactions going on, not just with the drivers of change, but also within you know, the way it affects us as humans and, and our livelihoods. That's a good point. This is John. I have a question, I guess, for um, for Jamie. And the work that you did on the human health indicators and environmental indicators, I think we had six of them that you highlighted that you and Larry have worked on. Do you think there's a lot of commonality among other tribes and indigenous peoples along the Pacific Coast? Or do you think there's a lot of diversity um, in how different communities would um, characterize those indicators? It's a good question. So I'd find that on the Pacific Coast, Larry and I have been working our way with different First Nations up the BC Coast and now starting to work with uh, some communities in Alaska. We find that there are a lot of similarities. Uh, each community is unique. As I said, uh, looking at the Slavich results, even from the Swinomish results, but the some of the basic premises of what health means are the same. And definitely the community connection and the education, those six main essentially do, don't change a lot on the Pacific Northwest Coast. Um, as I mentioned, there are what we call components under each of those main indicators, and, and we tailor those for each community. However, we have been working with communities in other parts of the United States, and in that regard, we have noticed some changes. And so I think it, I think what really highlighted is that definitions of health are very much place-based and natural resource-based. And so while the communities that go up to Alaska have similar natural resource bases, say the community that we worked with in North Carolina is very different. Um, and so the concept of indigenous health still resonates with that community, uh, but we did more tinkering for the indicators for them to to reflect those that particular community's values in North Carolina. I think you've done a lot to set the framework for this discussion as other communities and First Nations um, begin to explore climate change impacts and how it affects their communities. You've, I think you've really done a lot of the legwork so they can begin to take your framework, your reference, and tune it to their local needs without having to you know, repeat this work from the beginning, as you guys have done. So I think you've just done a lot to help um, advance this conversation on the coast. Thank you. That's, that is part of our goal. And, and as I said, Larry and I, and I'm sure Eric as well, uh, are very 
open and willing to work with other communities. So if you, any of you out there who have any interest and want to learn more, please do contact us. Uh, we don't want people to have to reinvent the wheel, and we do hope that we've created something that others can use. So um, this is Tammy at the EPA. I'm wondering if the other EPA folks on the phone think about, we have a tool called um, T first and C first, and it's a way to sort of pull data together. And I wonder if those tools would somehow help with the frame that you've put here, what you've put forward. And I don't know if our our Corvallis um, lab guy is very familiar with those tools, but I'm just wondering if that's an opportunity. Yeah, this is Steve Klein. I'm not uh, totally familiar with those tools, so uh, okay. um, yeah. Okay, all right. I can say that I, I did work with the Tribal Science Council a little bit and have played around with T-First. Okay. Um, I know that its, it's primary use is for uh, HRAs, for human, risk, human health impact assessments, risk assessments, in terms of contamination work, um, and is, is a model, right? So it's very numerically based. I think that there would definitely have to be tinkering in terms of what types of scales are used and working with numerical versus non-numerical data and also being really careful about weighting, about priorities. Um, because I often find when you use a conventional framework like um, HRA, so, you know, I mean, you've got your dose, your toxicity, your exposure duration, um, trying to add pieces to that. They don't necessarily sit equitably in the in the calculations and often tend to get more of a nod, but not a this is an important aspect or maybe even more important than the result morbidity and mortality that comes out of those calculations. Yeah. I think that's a key uh, construct that maybe um, deserves some attention is that traditional ways of looking at human health impacts um, uh, in in the U.S. and the way you're looking at it in the context of the uh, Indian nations there, um, that, you know, it, it's kind of like apples and oranges. In other words, the traditional measures are, you know, well-founded and numerical and, and based on epidemiological evidence. And so, you know, you've presented a much a larger context in this um, uh, indigenous health thing. And so I think that's just two systems colliding. Mhm. Mm yeah. Yeah. It's it, it it's it's messy and sticky and I, and I agree and I often find that sometimes when I'm in these conversations because we have thought about using the indigenous health indicators for natural resource damage assessments and ecosystem services evaluations um, and I often think that if there's a very established equation that it, that it's better to run them in parallel than to try and incorporate them together. I mean, I think the one thing with the, the Swinomish impact assessment is that, that, their impact, that the impact assessment and vulnerability assessments that we originally did did use constructed scales and didn't, didn't determine necessarily what a particular outcome would be. That, and so it's much easier then to incorporate the indigenous health indicators in that type of assessment than, say, a conventional risk assessment that already has, you know, is predicated on having a morbid, morbidity or mortality outcome. Right, and, and so the more traditional uh, measures of, of human health well-being, uh, diabetes, you know, any kind of human health endpoint, um, that I think it would be nice to, you know, have those statistics, you know, to actually be able to look at um, health indicators in maybe more um, established ways and then mirror that against the um, special uh, areas that you've emphasized that are you know, um, particular to the uh, Native American tribes versus just the way we see human health in a general way as, as you know, indicative of, of disease and, and morbidity, et cetera. In mm -hmm. other words, the, the ways that we measure uh, human health are more narrow than what you have laid out there in, in this context. Yes, I concur. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? We have a little more time left on the webinar, and I um, invite you to have any more conversations that you think are relevant. Also, Eric, if you want to back up a slide and put 
in your contact information one more time so people can email you and contact you offline. It might be helpful. Um, my name is uh, Gretchen Allison, and I'm on San Juan Island, and I'm a citizen, part of a group that is uh, looking at climate resilience out here on the island. And um, I'm wondering about, um, as sea level rises, is there any work being done to look at the gas stations, and boat yards, and the things that are going to possibly be sources of contamination when uh, when they get inundated? And are there any thoughts on trying to move those things upland? Um, I, I can answer for the tribe. I, I mean, I don't know in general. I don't know if you have a better idea in general, Eric. Why don't you answer for the tribe and then... Uh, okay, right. so a part of the, the reasoning behind doing the original uh, impact assessment was was primarily focused on infrastructure, things like the gas station, the hotel, um, at the north end of the Swinomish Reservation, which if you're on San Juan Island, you're very familiar with because you probably drive by it every time you come off the ferry. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what that impact assessment and climate change plan were really focusing on, was the infrastructure of the tribe. And so I think that the planning department folks at Swinomish have done a great deal of work thinking about that and want to be proactive. And so that in that regard, that honestly, as someone with a bit of a toxicology background is, is the least of my concerns. I think some of the legacy contamination in the area and things like March Point are much more of an issue than, say, the tribe's gas station because the tribe will be very proactive about moving it. I would also add, too, that on that same question, we the NPLCC has funded a project with Tina Whitman with the Friends of the San Juans. Mm -hmm. specifically to take the sea level rise vulnerability assessment that's been completed for the shorelines of the San Juans and communicate that and help interpret that with local uh, decision-making processes, holding focus meetings and that type of work. That project is still underway. They're, they're not at the point of results yet, but you might make a note or think about connecting with Tina Whitman from San, Friends of the San Juans regarding that project. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Well, listen, I want to thank you all for joining us. We had a great turnout, really good piece of information, um, both Jamie and Eric, and appreciate you guys taking the time to do this. Feel free to contact them directly if you have any questions, or get a hold of us here at the NPLCC, and we can help answer questions or provide more information for you. Thank you all again for joining, and um, please join us on our future uh, science management webinars. Hi there. I've got one one last query. Will this recording be available on your archive site? Yes, it will, on our website, mplcc.org. Okay, I appreciate it. Um, this is Keith DeBlonick in the Governor's Salmon Recovery Office, and we appreciate the presentation by you folks. Thank you much. Great, Keith. Welcome. Yep.